Well, good morning or good evening, wherever you may find yourself this day. Uh, I am Chris Dykus. I am the president of the Association for Fire Ecology and um, also serve uh, in my day job as a professor of wildland fire and fuels management at California Polytechnic State University. We are crazy excited that you are here and I recognize this is a truly global event. Um, we have over 255 registrants um, on uh, today that's representing 36 countries. So it's a really amazing and what a way to leverage uh, technology, which we're all getting better of today in these, uh, the, the, the COVID world. And not only we have uh, 36 countries that are here, it's also really exciting for me personally because we have a really good mixture between um, scientists that are out there uh, coming up with the, the, the new solutions and whatnot. And then we also have a tremendous amount uh, of folks uh, from the fire management world, which informs the scientists. And it's a really great partnership that uh, too commonly, we, uh, these two groups don't speak together enough. And so this is a really great time that we're gonna be able to interact and learn from each other from different perspectives, whether it be cultural from different parts of the world or from just the different sorts of uh, places that we're, uh, um, you know, what we're doing in our, our, our normal day job. All right, so, um, just let you know uh, if you can hit your mute button, that would be great. Uh, we got a lot of folks on here, so we'll make sure that it doesn't come through, uh, you know, on the recording. So let you know that you probably saw that this uh, webinar series is going to be recorded um, because it's uh, going to be placed up on uh, both the, the conference website as well as the Pal Costa uh, Foundation YouTube uh, site right there. So a couple of things that we're asking for everyone that's on there, if you're willing to over in the chat button, one of the things we're doing is just kind of introduce yourself and say who you are and where you're from. That kind of gets us a, uh, an idea of kind of a, you know, a sense of community that we have here. And also within that chat button, you'll see that uh, this is a place that you can ask technical questions, but we're also in this brave new world where we're trying all these new, exciting new things. We started using this, uh, a thing called uh, Slido. And so there is a link within the Slido, uh, with, within the chat that's there to Slido that you'll be able to go in and you'll be able to answer questions there. And you can actually vote on other people's questions that might be able to kind of move them to the top. So this is a brand new technology that we're using for the first time and hopefully it'll go uh, smooth and, and painlessly for you. But uh, again, we're trying to leverage new technologies as we're coming through and uh, make this, uh, you know, enter in this brand new, wonderful world that we're in. So just also some other house cleaning notes that you might have is that you can see that uh, if you're on social media, whatever um, you know platform that you prefer using, the hashtag that uh, uh, we're hoping to use is hashtag fire Florence virtual. Um, so if you're on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, whatever the kids are using today. If you're going to do a TikTok video, <laughs> make sure you put in, you know, hashtag fire Florence virtual. All right. So if we can go on to the next slide real quick, I'll show you real quick, you know, how did we get here? Um, it's kind of important. And this is a uh, long in coming. And uh, we first started out just, we started seeing some of the same players of like some of the leadership from Association for Fire Ecology. We would find folks from Pal Costa Foundation, uh, Mark Casano, Nuria Pratt and others. It's like, huh, we see them in the United States. I would be in Europe and I would see them there. I'd be in Australia, we see there. And we started talking, it's like, you know, what a great synergy. We have two different folks, Pal Costa primarily, you know, in Europe and South America, but certainly has a global reach. Uh, Association for Fire Ecology is primarily in North America, but, uh, you know, we have membership all across the globe. And so we're trying to like, how can we work together? How can we leverage, you know, our strengths so that we can provide information to folks, you know, that are, are needing, they're out there doing the stuff, doing the great work that everyone here on here is doing today. And so we started talking about, you know, ways that we might be able to, to interact. And we kind of decided on originally having, it's like, well, let's have a conference in Europe you know, uh, with Pal Costa and Association for Fire Ecology. And this kind of came in looking into the Region uh, Toscana and University of Florence uh, with the partnerships that Pal Costa had, uh, being able to work together to develop this uh, really awesome conference that we were planning for right now in Florence, Italy. Um, but, you know, the best laid plans, they, they don't always work out, you know, and this has been a very, very strange year with COVID and all the other things that are going on. 
So we uh, purposely elected to delay our in-person conference in Florence uh, by year. We're, we're all saddened by that, uh, but we recognize for the safety of everyone um, that's around and especially with all the travel restrictions, we had to do something different. And so someone came up with a bright idea. It's like, well, let's just not just delay it. Let's, let's, we've got the energy. We've got folks that are working on this. So let's come up with a virtual event, something that folks from all over the world can attend at uh, no price. And so we started uh, working on this. And so this is sort of the product of a lot of work with a lot of people uh, in many parts of the globe, kind of working together, uh, conference calls uh, for some people, you know, at 2 a.m., some for, you know, in the middle of the afternoon, some at 7 p.m., just trying to get home. So a lot of folks working, you know, putting the extra effort in to make this happen for you. And sort of the goal through this is our conversations, you know, between the different groups, you know, between AFE and, you um, Pal Costa and others at meetings, it was really astounding to us that regardless of the ecosystem that you're working in, regardless of the language and culture that you're in, that whether you're in South Africa, Australia, Europe, North America, where it was, it was really in, wild to see that we're all dealing with very, very similar problems, just in sort of different ecological uh, contexts. So we wanted to bring everyone around in this global event because we're all dealing with the same thing, you know, and we're all in this together, whether you're a fire manager that's doing the stuff or if you're a, um, a scientist that's helping inform this, you know, it's, it's a, it's a two-way street, as we say in the United States, where we're, we're learning from each other and we're forming each other. And so this is sort of the product of where we're coming, where we're going to be doing this again, yay, Florence, Italy, this time next year. So make your plans. I have no doubt COVID's going to go shoo shoo away and we're all going to be able to meet in Florence which is just absolutely amazing um, if you've never been there. So this is going to be a place that we're going to be able to share and discuss our ideas and really interesting something I'm really excited about is that uh, the journal Fire Ecology which is the official journal of the Association for Fire Ecology is going to have a special issue dedicated specifically to this uh, conference. So we're really really excited about that. Uh, the editor is a uh, put forth, you know, all uh, his, uh, his staff that go out there and, and try to have the, the best uh, uh, publications that we can possibly get that are coming from this meeting. So we'll, we can't do this at all, if we can go ahead and switch the slide real quick, without, you know, our sponsors. And because of the delays, you know, the sponsors uh, right now, we, we, we didn't really have a big push it, but we all know that to make these sorts of things work, to have a really, really good thing, we, we need uh, sponsorships, which not only makes the meeting well, but we, you know, the intention is, again, a two-way street is that the membership and the people that are coming to this will be able to frequent and uh, work with and, and utilize the services provided by our sponsors. And so really president of kind of a quick scramble to try to make this event happening is that we had the Italian Society of Civil Culture and Forest Ecology be able to sponsor us today, as well as the journal FIRE. And uh, without their early support right here, this sort of what we're doing right now wouldn't be possible uh, or would it certainly wouldn't be done in, in the manner in which we're doing it now. So if you are in an agency, if you are in a business, if you are an individual person that wants to advance this going forward, uh, you can see that there is a, the website down at the bottom, fireacrossboundaries.org uh, slash sponsors. And this would be a way for either you or your agency to get involved and to be a part of this, uh, to make this the very best conference going forward. And so we got a year to make this happen. So hopefully we can get on this quickly and uh, you know, advance this because it's got some really, really astounding conference that's coming up this time next year in Italy. And so with that, I'd like to introduce um, uh, Gianluca Calvani from um, uh, the Fire Management in Toscana, who's gonna to kind of talk to you a little bit about uh, the, the conference that uh, he's gonna be playing a huge role at, you know, the in-person conference in Italy. So. Gianluca, if you want to go ahead, take it away. Okay, thanks. Hello, greetings everyone. I'm Gianluca Calvani. I work in Forest Firefighting Management Division of the Tuscany Region. I give best regards on behalf of the Regional Council to all participants in this webinar to Pau Costa Foundation and to Fire Ecology Association who organized this virtual event. 
In partnership with the University of uh, Florence, we are working on the conference in Florence on the 12th, 15 October 2021, where we will talk about fire ecology together with the leading international experts in the sector. In this slide, we can see some pictures of the locations where the conference uh, will uh, take place, the historic center of Florence. It will also be an opportunity for everyone to visit Florence and Tuscany, which together with the monuments and cities of art will give you the chance to discover a splendid naturalistic and landscape heritage. And the technical and scientific contribution provided by these two events will help us to present. Good job, everyone from Tuscany. Hello, I'm sorry. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning to everybody. It's a pleasure for me to participate in the presentation of these webinars organized within the framework of the Congress. Uh, my name is Miriam Piquet. Um, I'm the president of the Pau Costa Foundation. And this virtual event is taking place in the same way that we plan to have the conference in Florence. But unfortunately, due to the current pandemic situation because of the COVID, the Congress had to be postponed to next year, October 2021. This virtual event is an opportunity to get the FI community together and facilitate the knowledge exchange and connect science and management. Topics chosen for the event are highly relevant at present. And today, the session will be about impacts of COVID-19 on the 2025 season, where five international speakers from Europe, United States, South Africa, Argentina, will present an overview of different regions. Tomorrow, the session will be about with deal with integration of fire ecology and the bioeconomy into wildfire management, where also five international speakers will talk about different perspectives of fire smart policies at the European level, uh, traditional fire management in rural areas of Africa and Australia, and fire ecology as a tool for post-fire risk management. Tomorrow, important, also will take place the announcement of the film festival winner. Well, uh, just to finish, uh, to say that I hope that all assistants enjoy these webinars and thank you to the organizers and supporters. And now I will give the floor to Matthew Thompson, the moderator of this session. He's a research forester with the Human Dimensions Program of the Rocky Mountains Research Station, NUSDA, Forest Service. Uh, his research interests include risk and decision analysis, system thinking, operations, research and analytics, wildland fire management and forest management. And very important, one of, this current, of his current focal areas is addressing COVID-19 impacts on the health and capacity of the wildland firefighting community. And in 2006, he received the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. So please, Matthew, that's your turn. And thank you very much. Thank you, Miriam. 
Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm very excited about the panel that we have assembled that will be speaking. Um, just one quick note, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the 2020 fire season. I am here in Fort Collins, Colorado, where we have been receiving smoke from the Cameron Peak Fire for the past two months. It is the largest fire in the history of the state in Colorado. It is uh, almost 100,000 hectares. It is also the location of the second largest outbreak of COVID-19 in Larimer County, Colorado. As of two days ago, they had 43 firefighters confirmed with COVID-19, and they are requiring people to go into quarantine. They're having to do testing. It, it certainly is an impact that, that is actually meaningful. Uh, so with that, I'd like to segue into our, our first speaker. Catalina Stoof is an associate professor in the Soil Geography and Landscape Group and the coordinator for the I'm gonna get this wrong, I apologize, Wangenengen Fire Center in the Netherlands. She specializes in pyrogeography and is the creator and leader of the PyroLife Innovative Training Network on Integrated Fire Management. She is a board member of the International Association of Wildland Fire and the Dutch delegate to the expert group of forest fires. And she will be speaking to us first um, around wildland fire management under COVID-19, the results of a global survey. Please, Catalina. Thank you. I will share my screen. And Matt, if you can let me know when everybody, when you can share, my, when you can see my screen, that'd be great. I can see it. Excellent. All right. Um, well, thanks a lot for having me, and and I'm excited to to present uh, some results of our global survey. Um, I have, uh, I, I know that the conference is using Slido, but I actually prepared two questions for the audience in Mentimeter. Um, and the first question is actually for, mostly for fire managers. So not for scientists, but for managers. Um, although if you're a scientist working on the subject, you can fill it out too. So if you can go to menti.com and use this code, um, you can also take a screenshot of this QR code. Um, there's a question on the things you've observed, uh, how COVID changed fire management this year. Later on, I have a question for everybody else, actually, um, because I'm now presenting the, the results of the survey that we did in May, and that was ahead of the fire season, of the, uh, ahead of the fire season in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, we are preparing a follow-up survey this fall. Um, my student um, uh, Amber van den Broek is working on that right now. And, um, and so we actually like to ask your input, like what would you like to know um, about this topic that we can ask in this global survey? Um, so with that, um, uh, I'll, I'll explain the reason and the rationale behind, uh, behind our survey, behind what we did, and um, I'll go over the results and so what we noticed, and this was in the, there was this was in a, in a WhatsApp group called Flamework, um, where we're about with seventy, uh, mostly fire managers, some scientists from Europe and from other places, and I noticed that there was a lot of cancelling of trainings and cancelling of prescribed burns, and we're talking early March here, like sometime in March, and it seemed to be that every team was figuring this out on their own. Um, we observed that COVID was likely to severely going to impact fire management um, because of social distancing and hygiene requirements. And what we did not want is that people would have to reinvent the wheel. So um, I, I connected with Peter Moore, who works for the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And, and we, based, we said, OK, we need to do this informal um analysis to 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 help people share their expertise and, and the guidance they develop um, so we can build upon each other's expertise instead of reinventing the wheel and this not reinventing the wheel is kind of linked to my our power life project as well uh, where we bring a fire knowledge from the south of europe to northwestern europe um, and apply our knowledge of water management to fire because I mean, there's so many things we know, either in different countries or in different research disciplines or pra uh, practice disciplines. And often it's about knowledge sharing rather than um, doing it all over again. 
So what we did is we collected procedures and guidance and um, uh, published this in an open access report. And we conducted a survey amongst more than 400 fire professionals. Um, and uh, we're working on the evaluation for this fall. So for the survey we did in May, ahead of the Northern Hemisphere fire season, we had uh, 443 participants from 39 countries. You can see that um, about one third of those was from the United States. Um, this, this, and, and, and quite a number were from, from Europe. We also have South Africa, Australia, um, Canada. This, this for one part reflects, of course, people that are engaged in this, but it also reflects, um, uh, I mean, for, from Canada, for instance, we got a lot of information from uh, like a lot of guidance documents. So they, so our network there decided not to share the survey, but really to, to give us the input from the guidance they developed. So this reflects our network, this reflects the people working on this. And obviously as the survey was in English, there's also a language uh, bias that was in here. In terms of general fire, man fire management, we saw that there were considerable worries about the impact of COVID on the operation of the organization. Um, we also saw that um, uh, people expected quite a lot of impact uh, of COVID that it would impede fire management. But it was interesting to note that people were also rather confident that the task that the organizations could perform their fire management tasks during COVID. Um, we saw that in, in fire suppression, most in fire management, um, uh, most hygiene requirements were widely adopted. So a control of group size, disinfection and cleaning, hygiene measures and social, social separation. Um, and, uh, but there were also services that were reduced and mostly support services um, that supported fire management and fire suppression. What was interesting, um, because, I mean, fires, they don't really adhere to borders or boundaries. And um, uh, it was interesting to note that uh, the respondents indicated that they expected a reduction of the ability to share resources and services. And they also expected um, that uh, the opportunity to receive help from other regions or countries would also be impacted. Um, what was helpful in that is that um, uh, I gave a similar presentation to the board of the International Association of Wildland Fire and a colleague there shared the checklist of the National Multi-Agency Coordinating Group to that, that is used in the, in the US to facilitate uh, sharing of resources. Um, one other thing that popped up very much was uh, uh, vehicles. Um, obviously, for social distancing, um, uh, it was it was there were a lot of people that indicated uh, there would be fewer people in vehicles, which means more vehicles. And one respondent commented that it was kind of like trading a known risk, driving while exhausted, and, and fatal accidents, for an unknown risk, the unknown risk of COVID transmission. Um, in terms of training and risk reduction, we saw um, uh, considerable impact on, on actually the cancellations and the reductions of, of, of training. Um, we've now seen that some trainings have started again and some prescribed burns are starting again. Um, but the cancelling of training and also fuel management and community engagement and risk reduction um, doesn't just mean that we're, re we're increasing the risk of, of fire right now, but also that this impact of COVID is likely to stretch longer into the future um, because, because there is, because of less trained personnel and, um, uh, and, and, and more limited fuel management. One other thing that popped out very much was, was there were a lot of concerns about the, the, regarding the lack of testing and personal protective equipment for firefighters with COVID symptoms, but without fever. And we know that people can spread COVID without symptoms. So um, it's really essential to supply protective equipment and tests to keep people safe. And it would be interesting to know to which degree this is, this is going on right now. And hopefully our, uh, our following speakers can, can can comment on that. 
Um, I'm going to go, go to my Mentimeter. Um, the question in Mentimeter is how did COVID change your fire management this year? And I'm seeing that burns were cancelled, more stress, altered response process, strain on resources, processes adapted. This is a, less people for help. So basically the summer, I'm giving a very quick summary here, but um, I'll actually post this on my, on my Twitter site. So, so you can look at this afterwards if you're interested. Um, you can see that the impacts are, are, really, are really broad. My next question for you is, is, is do you have any input for, for the survey, for the follow-up survey we're, we're making right now? What is it that you would like to know? So basically we're developing the questions right now. Um, like our first survey, we will, um, uh, when, we, when we publish this, this will be fully open access. Um, we published the other reports on our university website under a Creative Commons license. And it's available now in English and in Spanish. And I think we have a Chinese translation as well. Um, so if there's any, any input you have for, uh, for the survey, things you would like to know that um, of, of data we can collect and include in, in our report, um, let us know. I'll, I'll keep this open um, while I finish the, the, while I go to my last slide. Um, oh, and by the way, if, you, um, if you're interested in, in receiving uh, an invitation for the follow-up survey, you can also leave your email address there. So to sum up, what we did is we collected generic guidelines to support countries and agencies to prepare for managing fire during the COVID-19 pandemic. All our materials are open access, um, uh, both the, the guidelines and the global survey because we want this to be shared and used um, as widely as possible. Um, from the survey in May, before the fire season, or actually during our, 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 north, our temperate fire season, but before the Mediterranean fire season in uh, the Northern Hemisphere, um, uh, we found that the expected impact of COVID was high, but that there was confidence that fire management could proceed. Um, it was clear that limits were expected on sharing and receiving of resources, and we saw a decrease in training and prevention, um, which, which it likely increases the risk in, an, in the long term. Um, and like I said, we're preparing this follow-up survey. So here are the links the, and the QR, it's so both in English and in Spanish, and the bigger one is, is the English version, and the smaller uh, one is the Spanish version. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, in the session, in the question session after the talks. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Catalina. That was a, an important presentation. I, I will say that uh, the sharing of knowledge, I think, has been really essential uh, for understanding how to manage the fire in, in a pandemic age. And I don't know if it's purely causal, but uh, Catalina reached out to myself and many colleagues in the United States earlier in May, as she said, and in the subsequent months, um, knowledge sharing continued to be one of the primary things that people focused on. So hopefully, I think she helped plant that seed. Um, one quick reminder, uh, please go to Slido and update your questions, and you can also vote other questions that people have already entered, uh, and we'll hopefully have a pretty robust Q&A session at the end. So. Now we'll segue to our next presenter, who is a colleague and a friend of mine, Erin Belval. She is a research scientist in the Department of Forest and Rangeland Stewardship here in Fort Collins at Colorado State University. Incidentally, the location of the number one outbreak in Larimer County. Her presentation is titled Wildland Fire Management in the Western United States During a Pandemic. And a quick background, Erin uh, applies operations research methods to provide research products decision support tools, innovative frameworks and answers to policy questions using state-of-the-art empirically driven models and analyses. She specializes in the management of wildland fire, particularly focusing on the effectiveness and efficiency of the current management system and policies. She holds a PhD and a master's in engineering from Colorado State University and a bachelor's degree in physics from Reed College. And so with that, Erin, please take it away. Thanks, Matt. Thanks everyone for being here with us today. What a great opportunity to share to share information. I'm going to take the next 10 minutes to talk about wildland fire management in the Western United States during a pandemic. It's a huge 
huge topic. And I'm going to try and fly through some of the work I've done and some of the observations, what we've seen. I'm going to start by talking about some of the challenges we identified at the beginning of the season for Western management of wildfires. And then um, I will talk a little bit about the fire activity we actually saw this year during the during the ongoing COVID pandemic. And I'll talk a little bit about the outcomes we've seen. All right, so seasonal preparation, what did we see? Back in February and March in the United States, we identified that large fire management could be heavily impacted by COVID. And the reason, one of the main reasons for this is during large fire response in the US, we will send hundreds to thousands of people to a single incident. At that incident, there are what we call fire camps. And the fire camps are the sites at which personnel are provided with food, water, areas for sleeping, sanitary services. So if they're not fighting the fire, they're at fire camp. Fire camp is an area where you have large groups of people, you have high amounts of contact between them. There are sometimes low hygiene levels because you're camping out. It can be challenging to keep up hygiene in that environment. Um, and there's the potential for passing communicable diseases. We know that anecdotally, anyways, um, respiratory diseases have been passed around camp and, and regularly are every season. So the potential for COVID to get into a camp and then spread between personnel within that camp was a large concern. In addition to the fire camp, there's also an incident command post where the primary logistics of the fire are administered. It, sometimes it's at the same place as a fire camp, sometimes not, but the same idea is true. Again, it's a place where many people have high amounts of contact with each other. Um, there is contact between that incident command post and fire camp. I'm just going to generally call all that contact between those people at a fire, the fire camp. In addition to concerns about single fire incidences, um, personnel in the United States moved from large fire to large fire within the um, incubation period of COVID. So there's a concern of if COVID got into a single fire camp, would somebody move from that fire infected without knowing it to another fire and then start off another, um, another infection here. And here's an example of some of the movement that happens in the United States. This is Lolo Peak and the Checo fire from 2017. And the lines you see on that map in the, in the left there are where personnel went after they left that fire. And you can see they go all over the country. And the, the graphs you see on the right there show trips from, this is data from 2015 to 2018, um, how long trips were that were taken by crews, wildland engines and incident management teams. And what you can really see is we have our fire personnel traveling all over the country. So there was a large concern about camp to camp spread as well. Um, I was a part of an effort along with Matt Thompson and Jude Baham to look at the individual fire events and say, well, could these large fire events, could, could they become super spreader events? Could we see it, a large amount of COVID? The short answer is yes, there's absolutely the potential for these large fire events to have um, a large amount of COVID and be, become essentially super spreader events. Um, and then of course, once you have the large fire, you're still considering, okay, well, what happens if we do see, what happens to workforce impacts if we see crews going from fire to fire and more than one fire ends up with um, an infection, a set of infections. We were not the only ones concerned about this. The entire multi-agency community of wildland fire responders in the United States was concerned about this. And so they developed a set of mitigations. And as was addressed previously, one of the major mitigations was looking for ways to provide rapid sharing of lessons learned. And these were set up, there were online forms set up, there were regular weekly or bi-weekly calls set up, but fire management community, the fire management community came together and set up these networks so they could rapidly share lessons learned as everybody encountered these new scenarios and tried to figure out how to deal with them. In addition, the module of one con module as one concept was developed. That's where crews act as a single unit and try to minimize all um, contact with people outside of their crew. So the, the crew is acting as a pod or a family group, and you're trying to prevent the spread of infection between those pods. There were dispersed fire camps. So there was a lot less contact in fire camps this year because fire camps were, were restructured. Um, many of them used the hub and spoke model where there still was a central hub where logistical functions for the fire camp were taking place, but 
the camping that occurred, the, the uh, personnel were much farther spread out. And so there was a lot less contact between people. In addition, some of the incident management work occurred remotely and things like briefing where there were high levels of contact previously um, took place remotely or people tried to figure out ways to spread them out. Um, there were screening measures implemented. When you showed up at a fire, you were expected to self-screen yourself for COVID symptoms and you were expected to screen daily. There was an effort to increase hygiene measures at camp. Um, some regions did develop COVID-19 management modules where the management module could be integrated into the incident management team. And then that management module would take care of all things related, COVID related for that fire. So those are the mitigations that were developed over, particularly in the early season, um, February through April. Our fire activity this year, what we saw was pretty interesting. We basically had two separate seasons. So here's some context for you. This shows historical large fire activities from 2009 to 2019, so not this year. And this is the number of large fires burning uncontained on the landscape. And for those unfamiliar with the Western United States, each of these, these large fires might be hundreds to hundreds of thousands of acres. So these are really big fires. And you can see there's a wide variety of seasons that we've seen. There's a wide variety of observations for number of fires that might be on the landscape on any given time. If you're curious about that little spike where we have fires that are above 75, that was a single season and that was back in 2015. All right, so if we overlay what happened this year at the beginning of the year on our historical context, so that's the purple dots I just put up on the screen. The beginning of the fire season was a fairly median fire season in terms of numbers of large fires simultaneously burning on the landscape. However, we were expecting that there might perhaps be a more challenging later season because we had these, these are predictions, these maps are predictions of fire activity or of fire activity potential. And we knew that we could face in August and September um, significant wildland fire potential um, above normal in the Northwest and in Northern California. And on August 16th and 17th, California got hit by lightning. And this is a lightning map that you're seeing here, lightning strikes map. The area I have circled is Northern California, most of California, and some of the Northwest. And the lightning strikes in California, you're looking at over 12,000 lightning strikes. So we had the lightning strikes. They came from thunder cells with very little moisture. So we got the sparks, we got no moisture, and they were quick moving cells that had a fair amount of wind associated with them. And August 17th through August 24th, fire activity took off, particularly in those areas. Um, these are images from fires that started on the 16th or 17th. Um, mostly these are California fires that I'm showing you here. If we go back to that context or historical fire um, context, we tripled the large fires burning on the landscape in that period from July 16th through, or from August 16th to August 18th. So the second half of our fire season was quite challenging. And it wasn't only the Northwest that was on fire, other, or, or um, California that was on fire, other regions of the country were also struggling with high levels of fire activity. Despite the high levels of fire activity, the mitigations to, to avoid COVID during those large fire operations were continued. And these are images from some of those fires, not staged images, just pictures of people working. And you can see on the left, people adhering to masking and trying to social distance. And you can see on the right, people doing a dispersed briefing. Although, like I said, many of the briefings were remote. So outcomes to date, data around firefighter COVID cases is challenging to track in this country because so much of what we do is multi-agency and local reporting differed substantially. So we don't have a single database where we can go to get all firefighter COVID cases. So much of what we know is anecdotal. That being said, we know there were COVID outbreaks on fires. Like Matt mentioned, there's one in Colorado right now. However, from what we saw, from what we've heard, many fewer COVID-19 cases occurred on fires than any of the worst case modeling that we predicted. So the mitigation seemed to be quite helpful in keeping COVID down on fires. Um, there was a point in time when I believe it was the Northwest said, our firefighters have a lower prevalence of COVID than the general population. So that was a success there. 
The August pulse of fires, as far as we know, was not correlated with a pulse in COVID in fire responders, as far as we know. So that's really, that's really um, reassuring to know that some of those mitigations did work. Again, it wasn't perfect and we did see COVID on fires and we continue to. In the coming months, um, the picture on the left is the perimeters of all the area that's burned to date. Well, it's about a week old now, but to date in the United States, many of those fires have been contained, but many have not. So we have a lot of fire activity out on the landscape still, even though we're into fall. And we know that in some of those areas, we are expected to see that significant fire potential be increased throughout the fall. So there's a concern. There's a concern about end of resource uh, end of year resource use because we may need more resources than normal. Um, if fire activity or fire weather worsens, we could see that fire activity increase again, which would make it so that we need more resources. Again, they're back in camps and back in contact with each other. Um, so COVID-19 continues to be a concern into the future, even as we're looking at our off season, because our off season, we're not quite sure what it holds this year. That being said, all the mitigations were fairly successful and the mitigations are in place and the rapid sharing of lessons learned continues. So we are hopeful that if there were another pulse in fire activity, we hopefully would not see another pulse or any pulse in COVID-19 in fire responders. All right, thanks for your time. I'd be happy to answer questions. I'll move through that as quick as I could. Thank you very much, Aaron. I think we will keep questions for the end in the interest of uh, staying on time. And so next we are going to jump across the equator to the Southern Hemisphere. And I'm pleased to welcome Val Charlton, the Managing Director of Landworks in South Africa. She will talk about state of disaster, integrated fire management under lockdown. She is a conservationist and practitioner who is passionate about engendering community participation when seeking nature-based landscape management solutions. And so welcome Val. Hi there. I'm not sure. I don't know whether anybody can see me, um, but we it's can. great to be part of. Okay, good. I can't see myself. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> Um, it's great to be with everybody and thank you very much for, for asking me to join in for this. Um, I'm going to be asking Annie to change the slides, so if we could have the next slide, please. So I thought I would, uh, for those that don't really know much about South Africa, I thought I would give a, a very quick snapshot of what actually happened when, uh, when COVID started. Uh, we have a piece of legislation called the Disaster Management Act uh, was put together in 2002 and COVID was actually the first time that it was brought into action for the entire country. We've we used it on various times before, but not as a complete national thing. So we started with um, basically a week's notice from the 26th of March we were in a very hard lockdown, probably one of the strictest lockdowns that there has been. Um, retrospectively, it was probably a good thing to do. Uh, we did have the we did have the rush on toilet rolls, the same as the rest of the world. Um, but the one thing that was allowed for was that uh, the government set up a system where any business that was providing essential goods and services could register very quickly and easily online, and um, of course that was effective for all uh, emergency services, including fire services. So really, even though there was a full lockdown, very quickly, emergency services were up and running and um, were exempt from, from quite a few of the other things. Um, again, in context, uh, we had quite a few riots because of hunger. Um, most people don't realize that... Uh, there was nine million kids without a school meal every day. And the picture shows the queues four kilometers long uh, for food parcels. So it took a little while for that to lock in. Can I have the next slide, please? So um, integrated fire management for us, I think everybody knows that Africa is very much the, the fire continent and 
you can see the fire risk map at the bottom, but uh, we also have a really disparate and biodiversity rich set of vegetation types. Um, so, so we're definitely not what you see in the movies where we have savanna and just grass. Um, it, it's really quite different. And obviously there are slightly different fire regimes in all of those. What I've done for this little survey that we've done now to bring you this information is I did ask quite a few colleagues that are in the business, um, those that are in the south that are just about to enter their fire season, but also those further north, which have a winter fire season. And um, we've tried to bring together a couple of the, the things that happened during this fire season. Next slide, please. So, so um, the, the first thing really was around that operational readiness. And, um, you know, as I've said, the registration process was pretty easy, no problem at all. Uh, but then what happened was we really had to start working very hard on putting together new standard operating procedures and policies. And a massive amount of work went into, into putting those in place. Uh, very strict protocols around entry into premises, um, temperature checking, keeping everybody uh, clean and healthy, really. And uh, one of the things that did happen was that all public transport was shut down. So that immediately became very hard for firefighters that were traveling back and forward to standby, for example, to come into work. So there was a huge um, cost up front in terms of extra PPE, sanitizing, but also having to keep the guys on at, at base so that they could be on standby um, and be isolated and almost in quarantine so that they would stay safe. Next slide, please. So some of the operational challenges, well, I think, um, as was mentioned earlier on by Catherine, uh, we weren't really able to do any fire awareness whatsoever because, of course, there was absolutely no fire prevention, uh, fire door-to-door uh, -door allowed. Uh, schools were closed, so, so all of those normal activities didn't happen. And I think there was... Uh, I know from a Landworks point of view, we weren't able to do any of the fuel reduction that we would normally have done in the communities where we work. And I suspect that there was uh, quite an impact on, on fuel reduction generally. One of the problems that came up was um, at those fire lines and in those situations that some of the partners and the clients that, that uh, were part of the scenario we're not taking the COVID situation seriously. So um, trying to keep people separated did, did become a problem. Um, keeping crews isolated for extended times were, was a problem. On the fire lines also became, was problematic. And, and just in the public interface uh, because of traveling and the fact that some of the guys were going home at the end of the day and then they were potentially bringing infection back to work. So, so there was a lot of um, making sure on a daily basis that temperatures were taken, sanitizing took place and masks were worn all the time. Uh, other problems that happened was that the fire crew refresher training that would have happened didn't happen and there was definite or not as much happened uh, because we weren't allowed to bring people to one place for training, for example, or the training had had to be cancelled. So, so there was definitely an effect there. And also, as had been anticipated, uh, you could only get 50% of the people on a truck. So that obviously had a huge impact. Next slide, please. So um, the big thing really was that the planning up front definitely paid off. 
couple of the guys that I've spoken to have said that basically there was no interruptions in fire detection or error response, which is fantastic, really, if you think about it. And that was because they had, and we are made the point in bold, um, both ground crews and air crews, it was very clever rostering. Uh, the, even some of the planes were split up, so there was less, less guys sitting on standby. And all of those things uh, went to helping with not seeing a spread of COVID and being able to operate. Uh, we discovered the incident command system was used right across the board, including managing COVID as, a, as an incident within an incident and is still being used um, in that situation and will continue to be used, I'm sure. Uh, the one positive was, of course, because there were less people in the landscape, because we were all banned from moving around, uh, there, there were definitely less wildfires, less unwanted ignitions, although there were a couple of red days um, up in the north. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what, were, what were some of the lessons that were learned? Well, definitely... Um, one of the strong points that came across was that people have become personally responsible for their safety and, and also disciplined in, um, in the way that they work and what they do when they go home as well. Um, there's a, there has been less sickness in the workplace, which is quite an interesting point. Uh, and the guys in Cape Town said that, that they've seen there's definitely less flu and colds moving around. And we think that that is because of the social distancing and the, and the extra emphasis on uh, sanitation and, and cleanliness. Um, yeah, and South Africa really is a pretty resilient country. If I think of uh, some of the things that we've had to put up with over the years, we're inclined to pull together. And, and uh, COVID has, has definitely done that. Um, um, we're known as a rainbow nation. There has been some really tough things going on, but actually we, we, we have on the whole uh, pulled together, even when it is really hard for social distancing to take place. If you look at some of the places that people stay. And um, the, a couple of questions that, that were asked was, uh, around what were the top lessons learned? Well, well, personally, I think, and and the guys who are, are, I think, listening in can maybe answer as well. I think it has been this thing around um, planning. You know, we, we have the saying that if you, if you don't plan, you fail. And I think the planning has helped us not to fail. And uh, I, I think there'll, there'll be a lot of those things that are taken forward in the future. Uh, another point was that it was pretty hard for married firefighters not being able to go home and to have to stay in standby quarters for a long time. How, how sustainable that's going to be in the long term because we're about to have the fire season in the south now. Um, we'll have to see how that goes, whether it's actually practical in the long term. And I think um, that next slide, please. I think that's probably about it. Um, these were some of the co-contributors. Uh, by all means, they can answer questions later on as well if there are questions that are posed. These are guys that are operational. They've been managing fire seasons, uh, both pre-season in the south and then a full-on full fire season in the north. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Val. That was a very informative presentation. I, I think we're seeing some common themes here in terms of operational challenges, but also how um, innovation and creativity can solve problems, but so can planning. And I appreciate your point about planning. It reminds me of a quote that I actually just read last night from Louis Pasteur. It says, fortune favors the prepared mind. So that gets to the importance of planning. Uh, so yeah, we, say, we say fail to plan, plan to fail. Ah, that's excellent. <laughs> Um, our, our next presenter is Cristiano Federi. He is a research fellow at the University of Florence in the Department of Agriculture, Food, Environment, and Forestry, where he received a PhD in economics, forestry planning, and wood sciences. Main research activities are environmental modeling, 
geographic information systems, data processing, wildfire behavior, forest field dynamics and treatments, uh, experience as a consultant, uh, many international projects, and a volunteer firefighter and wildfire analyst in the region of Tuscany. The title of the presentation is Impacts of COVID-19 on Forest Fire Management Activities in the Tuscany Region. So please, Cristiano. Thank you, Matthew. Um, thanks uh, for giving me the opportunity to share our uh, experience. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. With this presentation, uh, I would like to give you an uh, overview of uh, the impacts uh, of the impacts of the pandemics uh, on all of the activities related to forest fire management uh, in Tuscany. Uh, we can consider this. Uh, an example, a clear example uh, of uh, what we have uh, seen uh, along all of uh, the Italy. As uh, many of us know, uh, probably uh, Italy was one of the first country after China uh, facing a a great amount of uh, cases of infection at the end of uh, February. This uh, caused a rapid uh, response uh, at national level uh, regarding uh, a series uh, uh, of uh, measurements of, uh, of measure of uh, restriction uh, to contain the, the infection, uh, including uh, many, many kinds of, uh, of measures uh, related to uh, school closing, or workplace closing, uh, restriction on uh, all kinds of gatherings, uh, restriction of internal movement, uh, but probably the 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 the, the main uh, a general a generalized stay-at-home requirements from the government. So it's clear that uh, many of these restrictions uh, had uh, a an effect, uh, direct or indirect on all of the uh, fire management activities, uh, starting from the, the firefight uh, and all of the coordination system uh, through the, all of the operators training and update activities, all of the prevention and also the uh, fire related research activities. Level, many new protocols and many procedures uh, were adapted in order to contain the, the infection and uh, in order to ensure the possibility to work in, uh, emergency, in emergency uh, like uh, a wildfire. The main uh, restriction about uh, uh, the firefighting activities uh, were related to the uh, possibility to use uh, the helicopters, a restriction on uh, the number of the operator uh, available uh, on, uh, on the helicopter uh, reduced to only one passenger. A necessity to uh, maintain social distances and uh, use uh, uh, PPE uh, specific uh, during uh, all of the operation uh, 
uh, was uh, a limitation, a, a very great limitation. Uh, moreover, in Tuscany, we had uh, a great number of volunteers and in some cases during uh, the first phase of the COVID emergency in Italy, we had some difficulties in uh, finding a person to operate uh, during, uh, during the wildfires. The same on the side of the coordination. You can see uh, the condition in uh, a field uh, command point and uh, in, uh, in, in, a, in an operational room uh, with the operators that uh, had to maintain uh, distances uh, uh, within person uh, and working with uh, uh, some uh, plexiglass uh, layer between the working position. On the side of the training and the update activities, uh, we had only online courses from March to July uh, due to the stay at home uh, restriction, the lockdown for uh, many of the, of the people. And uh, from July still now, uh, only a limited number of uh, trainees avail available uh, during the courses, a reduced number of courses, of course, uh, in order to ensure uh, distances between uh, person uh, and uh, continuing using health safety measurements and uh, restriction uh, such as uh, temperature measurement, uh, wearing face masks uh, and maintaining distances uh, in all of the courses. Uh, just to say, uh, in uh, 2019, uh, in the period between uh, March, March and June uh, in Tuscany region, we are uh, trained uh, about uh, 900 uh, uh, person and uh, this year in the same period only 275 so a huge reduction of the number of uh, person trained on the prevention activity side uh, we had the restriction uh, to uh, all of the silviculture activities uh, from March to May and uh, from May uh, we we was able to uh, treat only two areas uh, because of many of the operators were involved uh, in uh, firefighting uh, in firefight activities we had no weather condition for uh, all the, of the planet the prescribed birth and so only few treatment uh, on uh, specific high risk areas on the on the coast and the south side uh, of the Tuscany region uh, as you can see mainly uh, are mainly work of uh, pruning and thinning in uh, a large uh, wildland urban interface area. As I said, uh, we had six planned prescribed burn that were postponed, obviously, uh, at uh, this uh, winter, uh, with all of the related activities of research that we are carrying uh, out, uh, mainly related of uh, forest fuel dynamics and uh, the measurement of the efficiency of the performance of the fuel treatments. And in the end, also all of the 
other research activities related to wildfires were postponed, uh, like the analysis of the dynamics uh, in the on the vegetation in a post-fire scenario, uh, also the research related to water and soil in, uh, in a post-fire event, and all of the field activities related to the measurement of the efficiency of the prescribed burn in uh, different uh, climate conditions. Okay, thank you very much, Cristiano. And <clears throat> excuse me, now we will segue to our last presenter of the session. Again, going down to the Southern Hemisphere, uh, pleased to welcome Tomas Withington from the Forest Fire and Emergency Management Department in the National Parks Administration of Argentina. He'll be talking about COVID-19 impacts on the 2020 Argentina fire season. Uh, born and raised in Patagonia, a uh, forest engineer, uh, Tomas started as a wildland firefighter in the fire management system provincially, went through different roles in fire management, and is currently working as a fire management specialist in the National Parks Administration and a PhD student in fire ecology. Welcome, Tomas. Thank you, Matthew. Hi, how are you? And can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Well, Hi everyone, my name is Thomas Whittington. I'm a forest engineer working for the National Park Administration, specifically um, in the Forest Fire and Emergency Management Direction. Today, I'm going to talk about how COVID-19 impacted the 2020 Argentina fire season. Okay. I want to start by talking about how COVID developed in Argentina. The first case was detected on March 3rd, and 70 days later, the national government declared quarantine throughout the territory. This means the cessation of all activity with the exception of tasks considered essential, like health security or food crafting personnel. Along the time, this policy became more and more permissive, and today we have social distancing, but we still have many restrictions, like from one, like moving from one province or even uh, one city to another. Okay, as, as you can see, this figure show in red line the accumulated total case in Argentina. The active case in orange and accumulated recoveries in light blue. From the first case until now, the number of infected has always been increasing and with increasingly higher rates. Today, we are over the million cases. Well, this policy of quarantine and restriction have two main impacts on fire management. The first one, was that all activities not related with the fire suppression became virtual or frozen. This brought a challenge, especially in training and recruiting new staff. This picture showed uh, the first evaluation process uh, for new staff. Um, the other impact was the need of having a work protocol in suppression task. Each jurisdiction had to break its own protocol, but only a few got it. Remember that in our country, wildland fire is managed according to the jurisdiction for each provincial government. In the case of National Park Administration, the protocol was written by fire personnel without direct participation of specialists in health area, but in consultation with health authorities. Okay, in a brief summary of the protocol written by the National Park Administration, the highlights are, number one, a minimum possible expression of operation size and resource for each fire as possible. No? 
Number two, only use regional resources and avoid extra regional mobilization. This as long as the fire does not exceed the capacity of regional resources. Number three, work at all time with small crews and maximum isolation as possible in every time. This is to avoid mass infection. If there, any, if there is any case, only that small group is disactivated. Number four, avoid camps or massive accommodation. If they have to camp, they should be in many small camps. Number five, small group or virtual briefing meeting. This is because in Argentina, um, it's, it's almost a tradition uh, to hold very crowded um, operational meetings. Number six, number six, coexisting protocol in rest areas or in station during break time on a fire or performing normal duty duties on a station, staff have a behavior protocol. Number seven, 50% capacity reduction in personal transportation vehicles and sanitation after each trip. This point is very difficult uh, to inform the staff. Number eight, additional security equipment. Basically is alcohol, to wash hand and face mask. Um, the face mask was N95 type and the firefighter have to use it at all time in fire, even if it means that productivity is reduced. Anyway, uh, this protocol must be respected by, by the park personnel um, even if they work outside their jurisdiction. Okay, but let's see now what happened uh, to the fire season. Remember that so far this year, the season only happened in the north and part of the central region of the country. The current season was presented as extremely dry. It is common of part of the Northern National Park to burn every year, but this year, vegetation that is not commonly affected was burned. Reaching historical records in many stations. This row can be seen in the following figures for monitoring the relative moisture content of medium and large fuel. In the figures, the black lines are the current season, the red are the maximum historical data uh, for a date, and the green one are the are show the average values. Can you see the um, this um, maximum, historical maximum records this year. Well, uh, Cordoba province <clears throat> had an extraordinary burn area. Burned surface is more than twice the annual, the annual average. Despite occurrence was normal, also of many of these fires were in wildland urban interface areas. And Delta of Parana River, Delta region. The Delta of Par Parana River had a historical town spot that discovered a large area that were illegally burned to feed cattle. This region covered 14,000 square kilometers. Much of the problem of the fire in this region was the fact that the smoke traveled to large city such as Rosario or Buenos Aires. And finally, the Northwest region um, had, a, had and still have many large fires than normal. Okay, rounding the idea, a bad season to also have a pandemic. Conclusion. Uh, more resource allocation than in normal years, 
especially for that areas of the country, it is more common for their resources to attend the southern region. A huge logistical effort to keep isolation of task crews working on fire. The effort was also monetary. Until now, none of the people assigned to the fires COVID. After returning to their home cities, firefighters have to keep isolation for 14 days. So the local authorities will not be able to count of this person. And last, uh, greater social pressure to put out fire. This is a, a personal appreciation. Uh, the social confinement exacerbates uh, public opinion about the fires aided by the media and social networks. In addition to putting out fire, the fires, people ask for new laws and blame the real estate sector for producing them. Okay, that's it. Thank you all. I'm very fast to speak. Well, thank you, Tomas. I'd like to invite all of the panelists to turn their cameras on and unmute their microphones, and we will um, now transition into our question and answer session. And in looking at some of the questions that have been put up in Slido, um, we had actually uh, multiple questions around lessons learned. Um, so I'll, I'll read the, the top question and it's specific, specifically targeting Southern Hemisphere countries, but I'll ask all the panelists to respond if they want. The question says, Southern Hemisphere countries were the first to address wildfire management under the COVID-19 pandemic, and soon we'll start the fire season again. What are the top five lessons learned to bring on to the next fire season? Are we going to do this? Are we just going to talk? Yeah, if you want, um, why don't you start, Val, and then I will uh, maybe ask the panelists in turn. Well, I was going to say that I've got some of the operational people who have just been through the fire season. They are um, in the audience. So if, if any of them want to answer, I don't know how we do that. Um, but from a from a aviation and ground team point of view, they are there if, if they feel that they've got something that they want to to say, because their fire season's just finished in the north. Um, but, but I think I made the point earlier on about the planning and um, this whole issue of putting these really, really strict protocols in place. Uh, I think that that um, definitely has helped us get through this uh, and then, and then quarantining the firefighting teams seems to have been the common, you know, all that I did was aggregate a lot of the comments and then plus what we knew ourselves. That also definitely seems to have been a, a key point that everybody seems to have done is just to be really clever about how they, uh, how they put people in place and uh, resources in place so that they could react very quickly with the minimum amount of people. I think that's me. Great. What about, um, since we're talking about the Southern Hemisphere first, maybe Tomas, if you have any top lesson learned that you can share from Argentina? Sorry, can you repeat me the question? What would be the most important lesson you learned about managing fire under the pandemic? Well, see, uh, I'm not sure what <laughs> the lesson. In we have, uh, uh, I think, we have a, de a deficient logistic um, area in Argentina, so. And we need to improve that area in Argentina to facilitate the, the moving of the personnel to assign a new fire. 
What about um, other panelists from, from North America, Catalina? Any top lessons learned that came out through your survey work? I would love to be able to answer this question, but that's exactly what we're going to target in the follow-up survey. So I'd rather revert to to Erin because she will probably she well sorry for the pun, but uh, no pun intended. She's closer to the fire in that respect. Sure. <laughs> sorry. I think from what I saw, one of the crucial lessons learned, and I think this came up with all the panelists, was just the rapid sharing of, of information so that. Um, firefighters were able to adapt on the ground and use what other people learned in close to real time. Um, but I agree, actually, there we're wrapping up our fire season here and there are a lot of after action reviews occurring. So hopefully we'll actually be able to answer that question better in the coming weeks and months as, um, as we actually have time rather than just responding to the fires to sit down and reflect. Cristiano? Your microphone is off, Cristiano. I'm sorry, yeah, I see. Probably, um, I think uh, uh, the possibility to share with the other countries uh, the experience during this period uh, is, uh, the, is the best practice that we can uh, uh, take in place. Uh, I mean, uh, in Tuscany, we had uh, a low number of fires uh, in this fire season, and uh, the system uh, seems uh, had not to to have problem to 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 respond. But uh, you know, uh, sometimes we we had uh, in, in the past uh, faced uh, great fire season and uh, I don't know if uh, in this condition the system can react. So we have some two recent questions that seem to be more operationally focused. Um, one of them asked about the role of masks during uh, incident response operations, how and when they're used, uh, when is it appropriate and not perhaps, and a related question in terms of um, Kind of operations, not on the the masking gets at the individual concern. Um, at the at the group concern, more strategically, there's different uses of resources. So, for aerial and ground personnel, did you see using of masks, and if so, when? And then at the strategic level, did you see more reliance on air operations to avoid having ground personnel in close contact? I can address some of that in the US unless someone else wants to take a stab. Why don't you start us off? All right, so um, I know in terms of use of masks, it was varied across the US as people figured things out. But when people, what I heard was that people on the fire line, often as they're actually building fire line or working, they were working within their crew or their module. And so at that point they didn't need a mask, but they did try to mask up whenever they would come in contact with people outside their module. Um, and that did provide challenges in terms of communications because a lot of what happens on the fire line is actually reading people's face and lip reading because it can be noisy and you may not be able to hear perfectly. And so I know that the masks did provide challenges, but that for the most part, I believe people were trying to mask up. Um, and, the, uh, and, and I think that addresses that. In terms of more reliance on air resources, we saw a lot of reliance in air resources in this country, particularly at the beginning of the season when air resources were more successful because the weather was less severe. And so the goal was to keep fires small, to keep smoke down, um, and just to prevent the large fires from happening. So we, we did see a lot of aerial resource usage, not necessarily to prevent ground crews from coming in contact with each other, but more just to keep large fire currents down as best we could. The second half of the fire season, that was particularly challenging because um, it's a challenge to, there were smoke issues with flying, so visibility issues, and, um, and wind issues. So it was just harder to use air resources on those large fires. Thanks, Erin. Anyone else in terms of use of masks and transitions to reliance on more aerial resources? Well, I've got some comments coming in from my guys onto my phone, so I'll read what they're saying. 
Okay. Uh, Dean's saying, Dean saying we use flash hoods and buffs. And I think you saw that in that picture where they've got a, a, a flash hood, a flash hood on. Um, I know that Terry from Richmond, uh, one of his responses was to put the guys on standby under weather conditions that they wouldn't normally uh, have been on so that they were able to respond very quickly. That was one of the operational responses. But from a mask point of view, it's law here. If you're, if you're outside of your home, you have to wear a mask. So um, that's it. <laughs> so I, I think even in a team situation, um, it's not a home situation. So even in a team situation, the guys would be wearing uh, some kind of, uh, of mask um, unless it became really uncomfortable. I, I mean, there's no wishy-washiness here. If we're going to stick to the law, then we have to stick to the law and you have to wear a mask. That's it. Otherwise, we're breaking the law. Yeah. We're, we're oh. not like the US where they object to everything all the time, you know, as it being a civil right. It's not, not like that here. Val, I have a question for you because you used two words. Uh, it, so the question was about masks and you used the word flash hood and buffs. And I mean, if we have a very global audience. So can you can you explain those terms well, in, in other words? Well, I don't know whether Dean is able to come on, but I would I, I would imagine a flash hood flash hood is, you know, you know, we wear a Nomex. The guys automatically wear Nomex, okay, which sort of comes over. It's like a balaclava, but then they also wear um, this thing that they sort of pull up. So it's not a mask. It's almost okay. like. I suspect that that's got some, and, and you, you'll see in the pic, the first picture um, on the front is one of the guys from NCC, and he's wearing one of these things wrapped around his head and mm. covering his mouth. Specifically, and the bluff, is that like it's, a bandana? Or yeah, it's similar. I suspect okay. yes, yes. Okay. Yes, yeah, so that's what the one guy's got on. And the other guy's got a mask on. He's trying to answer me, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Technology is amazing when it works, right? <laughs> yeah, real real time digital communication. Um, yeah, anyone else talking about uh, more reliance on aerial resources or use of masks? Matthew. Uh, there we are. <laughs> Terry's answering and saying buff is like a bandana. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Terry. Uh, Tomas, did you want to? Yeah, I want to do a commentary about the mask. Uh, as I said, our protocol say that the firefighter should use it, use it all the time. But the reality is that they don't use it. In the fire line, uh, they put it down the mask and they breathe free. Mm. And I think it's worth addressing that one of the concerns around masks for our firefighters is um, they're already at high risk of heat stroke. So when they were on the fire line and unlikely to infect others and they were acting as a module of one with their crew, um, the mask, part of the reason they would remove it was to reduce um, health impacts of, of heat, which is a real concern. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so two other questions that I'll group into the category of maybe more vulnerable populations. Um, one question asked whether there was uh, a difference in uh, approaching vulnerable populations that work on the fire line. For example, in the United States, uh, there's a heavy reliance on prison crews in California as firefighters and whether that changed. Second related question to vulnerable populations would be those who were forced to evacuate due to a fire threatening homes and how those uh, individuals were managed when you can't necessarily uh, evacuate them all to one central uh, closed indoor location. So any thoughts on use of, uh, use of vulnerable populations in firefighting or the handling of vulnerable populations after evacuation? We did, we did have a fire here in the Netherlands in April. Um, so this was not a result of the survey, but um, oh, actually we had, we had two 
well, for the, the, the Dutch conditions, really big fires that lasted several days. Um, and for one of them, there was a village that needed to be evacuated. There was 4,000 people were evacuated. Um, and this was mid-April. So what they did is they, um, they, they, they deployed several uh, really big buses. And, um, and with the buses, they transported small groups to, to several um, uh, locations where they could be um, safe from the fire, where, where, where they were evacuated to. The challenge then arose that at the moment when they could go back to uh, their house to pick up essential things, um, and that's when they use minivans and, and people were close together. So um, there would, I mean, and I must say that a fire that lasts more than one day in the Netherlands is, is, is extremely, um, extremely rare. And then to have this during a pandemic is, is, is even more extremely rare. So, so people were figuring out things on the go, basically. I, I am unaware of any research efforts or any information on what happened with evacuations in the United States regarding if it increased COVID cases. And I've been curious about that. So if anyone knows any work that's being done, send it my way because I'm interested. Um, what I have seen, this is anecdotal, but what I've seen is that they are still using centers um, and they're just trying to provide bigger centers with distancing at the centers for people who are evacuated because we did have a number of people evacuated here. Um, so that's regarding evacuations. Regarding uh, vulnerable populations and the, the crews that are used, California tends to use a lot of crews um, that are people who are in prison. And this year, there were very few of those crews that go out. So they have over 150, sometimes around 200 crews in California that are type one crews that go out from prisons. And um, very, very few of those went out this year. So it did have an effect on, on resource usage and resource availability in California in particular. Hey, any, can, any can, issues with evacuation from other panelists? We don't evacuate much. Really, um, the logistics of evacuation for us are that um, a lot of places that communities stay, there are no roads. So, so they don't get evacuated um, on the whole. Um, it would have to be really bad and, and close to an urban edge um, for it to be an evacuation. Um, I've got a comment here from Simon Thomas, who is the um, heads up the provincial air response for KwaZulu-Natal, and he says, air crews cannot use masks. Um, the aircraft gets sanitized inside and out day or inside daily, and, and that's it. Okay, just. Well, thanks for that. Uh, Cristiano or Tomas, did you have any experiences with uh, managing evacuations? Uh, not uh, from my side, because it's not so frequent uh, to evac evacuate uh, in Tuscany, so. Yeah, and there was a, a comment that I'll just reference uh, in the chat window, uh, making the important point that uh, wildfires are not the only natural disaster that would result in evacuations. For example, here in the southern United States, we had hurricanes. And so how, how are those lessons being shared, not only amongst the fire community, but amongst, um, I guess, emergency response, nat natural hazard response communities. Um, Tomas, did you have any issues with the evacuations or, or mass gatherings in Argentina? Sorry, <laughs> about the evacuation here in Argentina in the fire manners managers, it's not uh, our job to do evacuation. The evacuation is, um, I don't know the name, uh, civil guard or something like that. C civil yeah. protection is. Okay. So uh, a next question which came up in the chat window, but also uh, was in the Slido questions. And it's probably a question that's on many of our minds how many firefighters got COVID? Um, do we know? 
do we know at the regional level, at the national level, at the international level? Um, I know some of you, I think, mentioned it in your presentations. Maybe I'll just go through each panelist in turn and ask them to comment on what they know about the number of firefighting cases in their respective uh, communities and countries. So, um, Tomas, you're on camera. Why don't we start with you? Do you know how many firefighters in Argentina got COVID? Well, I, I, I don't have a, any, a, any idea. Uh, in, in our institution, we don't have uh, infected with COVID uh, during assignment, but we have uh, infected in, in extra working duty. What about uh, Cristiano? Do you know numbers of infected firefighters? in Tuscany or in Italy? Um, I can speak about Tuscany. Uh, I can say we know just uh, of one case uh, of uh, operators uh, with COVID, uh, but uh, really we don't know exact, exactly how many because uh, we, haven't, we haven't the possibility to check all of the volunteers. So we, we don't know. Val, what about uh, in South Africa? Well, I'm getting here, as I say, I'm fielding responses coming through from my guys on the ground here. And Dean is saying, um, who operates basically Western Cape and Eastern Cape, maybe a couple of other places. He said, we were lucky to have no infections and that we believe was due to our planning and strict controls. However, the second wave might be different. So remember, we're about, to maybe face this second wave mm. of infections. And we're going into our main fire season in the south of the country now. So we don't know whether hopefully we'll be okay. Uh, working fire teams did have some infections in Cape Town. I don't know about the other guys, um, but it would be something that would definitely be worthwhile finding out if there was any, any more. And um, Aaron? the current status in the United States? Yeah, it's um, the data collected on COVID cases was really inconsistent across teams, across counties, across regions. So we don't know, things are pretty anecdotal. There absolutely were a number of firefighters infected with COVID. The one I'm aware of, um, that I'm most aware of is, and the biggest outbreak I'm aware of is the fire near us where we know that there were 42 firefighters infected and that was a single incident. Um, and so there were probably substantially more than that, but collecting that information is going to be a challenge that hopefully we will attempt to do this winter. And lastly, Cata, Catalina. Yeah, so, um, so, so there's two things. One of them is our survey. Um, and, and I saw that one person on the Mentimeter suggested asking this in our survey, so we'll definitely in include that question. I see that Marty Alexander is also interested in whether there are any death, deaths reported. Um, so we'll take that along in our survey. Uh, regarding the Netherlands, I was just seeing if I could find something on Google. Um, uh, there have been cases of COVID in the fire service. Um, our fire service is, uh, uh, is, is mostly volunteer and uh, the people that do wild and fire fighting uh, do mostly urban firefighting. So if, when, if we have any data, it will be for the fire service in general or for one of the 25 or 27 safety regions and not for wild and fires uh, in specific. But um, uh, we'll, we'll check into this, and um, I hope to be able to report more after our survey is out. In. Yeah, I, I think this is one of the, the biggest unknowns about this whole issue is just the difficulty in keeping uh, consistent, updated data, uh, especially when you have people from different response agencies, multiple coordinators and, and collaborating agencies. You combine that with the fraction of people who are going to be uh, mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic, mm -hmm. especially when you have a younger population, typically, at least those who are on the front lines. Um, so, you know, it's plausible that it could be far greater than we know, um, and we just haven't observed it. There's obviously limitations in testing, at least here in the United States. There's been many incidents where testing was just not available. Um, 
So, yeah, I think it's going to be one of those uh, unknown unknowns, and we're going to try and do our best to get a handle on it. Uh, Marty, I'm not aware of any deaths in the United States. I do know um, that recently one of the firefighters on the Cameron Peak fire had to go into intensive care. Um, so certainly we've seen some severe health impacts and, and hopefully, hopefully no worse than that. I think what will also be challenging is, is uh, there, I mean, when there's firefighters working on the fire line for like long periods of time, then you can say, okay, th there's an outbreak at a, maybe a fire camp or something like that. But um, in Europe, we don't have fire camps. And so people go, go to their homes at night usually. And, um, uh, and because we, we largely work with volunteers, um, they might they might catch COVID in their in their day job, um, um, and and so they might catch it in a fire service. They might catch it in a day job, and also I'm not sure if there's if there's mandatory reporting. Um, so I, I think getting getting really accurate numbers is indeed going to be very challenging. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm scrolling through the questions on Slido. Maybe uh, another one, and this gets to the point that I think Val has mentioned many times, the importance of, of looking ahead, of, of planning, anticipating what, what you might be facing. So here is a, a question in that, in that spirit. Um, what do you anticipate for 2021? Uh, will COVID precautions remain? Or, or be lifted in some other combination? Uh, what precautions might we need to continue uh, to increase or can be removed? Um, and and one, one little editorializing that I'll add on to that question, um, if, if people have begun to think about it, is have your respective countries, uh, organizations, communities begun having conversations around um, how firefighters will be prioritized for vaccines if and when they become available? Mm. Good question. Um, uh, okay, well, I'll, I would say that for sure, we're going to be operating like this for quite a while, I think without hesitation. And um, we're at a level one now. Uh, so life's not by any means normal. As I say, social distancing and the wearing of masks is still compulsory. And I expect that that will continue. Um, there is talk of a of a second wave. Um, but then uh, temperature wise, our temperatures are going to be going up, right? Because we're hitting our summer now and that might help. And if I look at our stats generally, if you look at the stats for South Africa, even though we expect that there is a report, an under reporting, uh, we really haven't done very badly at all from, from an actual um, COVID illness and death perspective. So, so long may that continue. Um, from a safety point of view in the workplace, I think it will continue very simply because these firefighters, most of them are from um, fairly poor backgrounds and uh, lower income, and they cannot afford to lose their job. They cannot afford to get sick. It's just as simple as that. So um, I anticipate that if they need to carry on doing what we're doing, they're going to carry on doing what we're doing. Yep. Um, Aaron, why don't we ask you, what do you anticipate for, for the for the coming fire season next year for the United States and how organizations may or may not change their mitigations? Sure, I expect with the United States, there will be many of these mitigations will be continued. And what I think a lot of people are hoping for over the winter is to gather up all the lessons learned and to get a little bit more consistency across the fire world because this year there was a lot of experimentation. People were trying to figure stuff out as they went. And so a lot of the after action reviews that are happening now, hopefully we'll be able to gather them up and continue to put many of these mitigations in place, but a little more consistently. A really interesting piece of that for us is that some of the stuff that people tried, um, we're getting feedback that they actually really liked it. Um, some of the different count procedures and stuff seem to be really valuable, even outside of COVID. So the other thing we're trying to gather up is 
what are the valuable lessons learned that are valuable even outside of COVID because COVID gave us, mm -hmm. it required the experimentation, but it also allowed for this new creativity and flexibility and figuring out how to manage, particularly for us, the large fires. Um, so we're still figuring things out, but I do anticipate next season, we will certainly see many of the COVID operations in place. Um, they will continue, hopefully a little bit more consistently. Uh, with regards to a vaccine, I haven't seen much in terms of how uh, firefighters will be prioritized here, although um, here it will depend on how the firefighters end up getting classified, I believe. Yeah, one, one quick addition to, to Aaron's comment about how many of the mitigations may be uh, persistent or durable even beyond the pandemic. We've had uh, anecdotally heard from many of the crews that they are more healthy and well rested than they typically are at this stage of the fire season. And that is in part by avoiding those large congregations of people where even in the pre-pandemic days, respiratory illnesses and other uh, viruses yeah. could, could be spread. That has shut down. So there's, there's, there's going to be, I think, a movement to keep this kind of hub and spoke, uh, you know, separated model and hopefully they can be um, able to capitalize on telecommunications for briefings. Um, well, thanks, Aaron. So let's, let's keep with the question of what do we anticipate uh, being the opportunities and challenges in the, in the coming fire season? And, and Cristiano, I'll, I'll go to you next, please. Yeah. Um, considering the numbers of infection in these days, uh, Probably the next uh, the next winter fire season. Uh, we had uh, a, a winter fire season on the northern part of the region on the mountain. Uh, probably uh, we will uh, work with the same uh, uh, measures and the same restriction uh, uh, in this winter. I don't know for the next summer fire season because uh, we. Nowadays, we, we, we have no, uh, we, we don't know uh, how a vaccine will be ready. So uh, we, we can say probably yeah. we will work uh, the next fire season on summer with the same uh, condition uh, that we have uh, had. And, and Tomas, perhaps you can comment on on future fire seasons and management response in Argentina? Yeah, well, first I would like to know what will happen to the COVID. We are still waiting for the vaccine and the firefighters are considered a priority to take it. Uh, in while we continue with the virtualization process of the task that allow it. That's and Cat Catalina? Yes, there you go. Uh, we'll be we'll be with the pandemic for for another long while and and so we plan on on doing keeping keeping on doing these surveys the idea is to do it twice a year. Um, in in terms of uh, firefighters being um, uh, maybe getting preference when when there is a vaccine, um, I, I I was just trying to 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 see if in the Netherlands there is talk about that. But the only thing I I read is um, is about uh, older people, people with vulnerable health, uh, and also people working in uh, in hospitals and, and, and other doctors, for instance. They're also discussing um, maybe teachers, um, but emergency personnel, like firefighters, other than, uh, than doctor emergency personnel, I, I haven't seen that. Uh, I haven't seen firefighters mm. in the list of, of people to get preference to a vaccine. Yeah. So, I think maybe we'll we'll have time for one one more question. Uh, we're getting close to the to the top of the hour here, and I'll I'll go to this this last question that just appeared in the chat window. Um, I think there's a question behind the question. 
Uh, given the low numbers amongst the wildland fire management community, perhaps we should pass that result along to the wider world. Uh, perhaps that question means, do mitigations really work? And if the evidence seems to suggest they do, how do we best convey that information? So we, we started this uh, panel with Catalina talking about the value of, of sharing knowledge within communities. How do we... Mm -hmm. How do we cross boundaries and share it more broadly? That also gets to the question of uh, evacuation does not only uh, originate from wildfires. So um, I'll ask the panelists just to uh, comment on how do we convey the, the message that mitigations might work if in fact you believe they work. You have to say who, who needs to start, Matt. I was gonna say. We're yeah. all thinking. <laughs> Well, since you're on camera, Catalina, why don't we put you on the spot? First, I, I so so from the things I've seen um, myself, I mean, and, and not the new things I heard today, um, I would still really like to know if if the wildland fire management community indeed has lower infections than the general population. I mean, I, I'm a scientist, so so of course when something like that is being said, I would say, okay, I, I would like to see the data. Um, but what we hear from the U.S. is 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 indeed promising. I'm just very aware that um, uh, I mean, at least in the Netherlands, there's there's an incredible shortage on testing. Um, I mean, if even if your partner has COVID and uh, and you don't have any any symptoms, you can't get tested. So um, I would. Mm. It's, it, I, I, I'm very aware of that. The data that we have on COVID infections can be really biased by this, by this lack of, uh, or the shortage of testing. Um, of course, if, 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 if indeed the data is reliable and, and, and I, especially the, 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 the things, the news coming out of the US is that where it seems that there's fewer infections, then, I mean, maybe wildland firefighters are, are, they follow more orders than the general population because here where I'm from, I mean, we have a, a, a partial lockdown and people still go out. They don't, they don't follow up on the, on the orders. So yes, we can learn, but maybe then we can, can learn from uh, the nature of people to follow up orders and instructions rather than the distancing. Yeah, I, I think one of the things you're getting at is compliance behaviors are so important in all of this. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe Cristiano, would you care to comment on, on experiences and if mitigations appear to have worked? Yes. I think generally Yes, the the works. Uh, I totally agree with uh, Kathleen with uh, with something related uh, more on uh, the behavior and the habits of the people. But uh, basically, we can say yes. Uh, by my side, uh, the works. Great, Tomas. Well, I'm not sure if I understand the question, but I believe that, that by respecting the protocols and health recommendations, any groups will have less infected. Yep. Mm. Um, and Aaron, and then Val will close with you if that's okay. Yeah, um, I, I come from a modeling background. And when you look at the modeling across what could have happened, both what we did for in camps and, and what we've seen around the country, the models we've seen that um, many of them are quite accurate. Um, when I look at what occurred versus what we thought could occur, the mitigations were huge and very, very important. And so I think getting that message out is really important. I think there is an opportunity, and I don't know how we would push this, in the um, incident command world in the United States, because I know that some of the fire incident commanders are shared um, and used in or are sent to think to other natural disasters when they need additional incident response. So I think there is an opportunity to share some of those 
lessons learned across the management world, although um, I'm not sure I'm personally in a place to push that, but it, it is something to be thinking about, I think, for sure. Thanks. And Val? Well, I see Terry's just posted a message to say maybe it's got something to do with the fitness level of firefighters, which I think is true. So how could you separate the discipline of being uh, healthy, um, what's the word, sanitization versus the fitness level? It would be quite difficult to to actually separate those two. I think um, I think for us here, it would be probably quite difficult to get good good solid data together across the service. But what might be quite interesting is to compare organizations that had a really, really strict protocol in place versus organizations that were a bit more lackadaisical in their approach. And, and, and then to be able to try and draw some conclusions there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It would be a really hard thing to do as good as it would be. Yeah, I, I think, you know, this, this goes back to the, the origins of this of this presentation, which is sharing knowledge, but also, uh, in you know, the scientific pursuit of understanding what really happened. And I don't think we fully know that story yet. Um, yeah. But we've learned a lot more uh, from our wonderful speakers. So I'd like to, again, uh, thank them. And we're just about to wrap up. Maybe I'll invite um, Chris Dykus back for uh, to wrap us up. Pleasure to do so. What an amazing day. I, I'm happy I got up at 5 a.m. to make this happen. <laughs> this is a really, truly international event. And, uh, you know, uh, in, there's a saying in the U.S. when life gives you lemons, like with COVID, make lemonade. And so this is a really great event. I would like to thank, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the panelists that are here uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Italian Society of Civil Culture and Forest Ecology and the journal FIRE. And most importantly, I, I want to thank you um, for, for being here because, uh, I mean, this is, we are a global community. And um, I want to say that uh, uh, we need you to be involved. You know, I'm so happy that you're here as a passive uh, a participant. But, you know, getting involved, whether that be an association for fire ecology, Pal Costa, your local organization within there, we all have a role to play. And sitting by the sidelines, we can learn a lot, but you have a lot to contribute as well. Just the last thing I just want to know is like, this is such a great talks today. And if you're like, wow, man, I wish I really would have had this person here that I'd be able to share. These are uh, this, uh, the talks that we've had today have been recorded and they will be put up on the Fire Cross Boundaries website as well as the Pal Costa Foundation YouTube. So that is coming. I want to remind you that uh, in addition to us to meeting tomorrow, which we're going to kind of shift gears and we're going to talk about integrating fire ecology and the bioeconomy into fire management, is that we still have some really amazing films that uh, a lot of people put a, a, an enormous amount of work into. Uh, so you can see the slide there, firecrossboundaries.org slash films. You can get in there and look at those videos and vote on the winner. So again, thank you so much. Uh, we couldn't do this uh, without you. We do this for you, but we're all doing this together. And uh, what a long, strange trip it's been this year. So uh, until tomorrow, I'll say adieu. And thank you again so much. And have a great and wonderful rest of your day.